So apparently, Mark Burnett, the guy that did the reality show Survivor, he did a miniseries for the History Channel called The Bible, and it debuted to some of the largest ratings ever in the history of television. And uh, Mark Burnett and his wife have been going around talking about how they want to have this stuff taught to our kids in public schools. So obviously, I knew I had to check this out for myself. So I went over to the History Channel, which really is the history, what Dr. Pepper is to doctors. And this is what I found, man. Right away, we get a warning that basically says this is based on a true story. So you know this shit's going to be good. So in the beginning, there was an all-powerful, all-knowing God. And he was like, this sucks, man. What is the point of being so damn awesome if no one tells me how awesome I am? So he makes a couple people to kiss his ass, Adam and Eve. And of course, he makes them white because fuck you every other race on Earth. And obviously, he also makes them hot because God don't make no uggos. So almost immediately, Eve starts fucking shit up, just like a woman would do. And then the next thing you know, motherfuckers are cracking each other in the head with rocks. And God says, fuck this shit, I'm murdering everybody. So God drowns all the men and women and children, all the innocent little babies, all the cute little animals, drowns them all brutally. Except for White Noah, the whitest man in the Middle East and his family, because God loves honkies. And White Noah's telling us about how God rested on the seventh day. Because we all know there's nothing more that an all-powerful being needs than lots of rest. So the next thing you know, we have Abraham, who's a descendant of Noah, and he's on a mountain, and he's starting to hear voices, and the voices tell him, go into the next village, kill all the motherfuckers, and take all their shit. So that's what he does. He goes to the next village, and kills all the motherfuckers, and takes all their shit. And the next thing you know, he's banging his slave girl, who's really hot. And then the next thing you know, he's got a kid with his wife, and a kid with the slave girl, and his wife ain't having it. She's like, oh, hell no, that bitch gotta go. So Abraham banishes his own son and his slave girl out into the wilderness, like the biggest douchebag in the history of Earth. And the next thing you know, Abraham's hearing voices again, and the voices are like, Hey, you know that town Sodom? Well, they're having a little bit too much fun over there. They're having sex, drugs, rock and roll, dancing around, and I can't have people having that much fun, so I'm going to kill them all. And Abraham's like, My nephew Lot lives down there. So God's like, I tell you what, I'll send some angels down there to see if Lot is righteous. And Abraham's like, Aren't you all knowing? Wouldn't you already know if Lot is righteous or not? What do you need angels for? And God's like, Dude, do you only send angels or not? And Lot's like, Fine. So the angels go down there, they get the shit kicked out of them, and they're like, Help us, these guys are trying to rape us. And so Lot is like, okay, I'll help you, dude. So he breaks him inside his house and shuts the door. And the townspeople are pissed, man. They're like, let us rape those dudes. And Lot is like, how about I let you rape my little virgin daughters instead? And the townspeople are like, no, we want to rape those dudes, man. And then the dudes are like, fuck this shit. You ain't raping us, man. And they break all bad and go in slow motion. And the next thing you know, the angel's like, rape this motherfucker. And then they're all blind. And they're all screaming in agony. And the angel's like, let's get the hell out of here, dudes. And so they're all running away. And then suddenly the Asian dude's like, I got this shit. And he whips out his sword like he's fucking Kratos from the God of War. Because obviously a supernatural angel will be using man-made weapons. And he just goes fucking ninja warrior on everybody. Starts slicing and dicing people. Pulls out some Matrix moves, man. Uses his drunken monkey kung fu. Just like an Asian would. And the next thing you know, they run away from the city and God's firebombing it. Even though he can snap his fingers and have it disappear off the face of the earth. God's a drama queen, so he's got to firebomb that shit. And the angels are like, don't look back. But there's always one bitch who can't fucking listen. So she turns around and looks. And she turns to salt because that's what happens when you look at shit. God tells you not to. You turn to salt. And then light covers his daughter's eyes up, and later on takes him into the mountains and has an incestuous three-way with him. That's what the Bible really says. So the next thing you know, Abraham's hearing voices again, and the voices are like, Hey, Abraham, why don't you murder your son? So Abraham's like, Sounds good to me. So he gets his knife, and he takes his kid up on the hill, and he grabs him, and he starts tying him up. And he says, Sorry, dude, I gotta kill you. And he puts him up there, and he's just about to stab him. And the voice in his head says, Dude, I was totally just kidding. You're one crazy motherfucker. And then Abraham's like, But I gotta kill something. So the voice is like, well, then you got to kill something. Just kill that innocent little cute lamb over there that never hurt a fly. So Abraham does. He murders that cute little lamb. And the son's like, get me the fuck away from this crazy asshole. And it turns out that kid grew up to have another kid named Israel who led the Israelites who were God's chosen people. But God always shits on his people. So the next thing you know, these people are all enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years, man. And the next thing you know, Moses is sword fighting with the Pharaoh for some reason. And then he cuts his face and the Pharaoh's all pissed off. And the next thing you know, Moses is walking around, he's all bummed out, and he sees a dude beating a slave, and he's like, oh, hell no, and cracks that motherfucker with a rock, so he has to run and hide in a tent. And so one night, while he's hiding in his tent, he starts tripping balls, man. He starts seeing a burning bush, and the burning bush is like, dude, it's me, it's totally God. I need your help, Moses. I need you to go back down to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people be free. And Moses is like, what the hell would you need me for, dude? You're all powerful. If you wanted your people free, just snap your fingers. They'd instantly be free. It doesn't make any logical sense. And God is like, dude, just fucking do it. So the next thing you know, Moses is down there saying, hey, dudes, God sent me to set you guys free. 
And they're all like, why the fuck would God send you to set us free? He's all powerful. He can just blink his fingers so we'd instantly be free. It doesn't make any logical sense. And Moses is like, I know, right? God is crazy. So the next thing you know, Moses is in front of the Pharaoh and he's like, God says, let my people be free. And Pharaoh's like, fuck that shit. And Moses is like, you'll be sorry. So the next thing you know, the Pharaoh's bathing in the river. And Moses is like, watch this, dudes. And he totally turns the river to blood. And the Pharaoh's like, what the hell is this shit? And Moses is like, it's blood, bitch. Set my people free. And the Pharaoh's like, never. And Moses is like, all right, dude, I'm going to fuck you up. So the next thing you know, there's frogs everywhere. There's maggots. There's flies. There's dead animals. There's hell. There's boils. All kinds of bad shit going on. But the Pharaoh still says, fuck you, dude. So then Moses has to go down and break the bad news to his people that God's all pissed off. And he's going to kill everybody's firstborn son. And they're like, what the fuck, dude? Why would God take it out of our kids? Our kids have nothing to do with this, man. If God is mad and wants us to be free, then why doesn't he just snap his fingers and we'd all be free instantly? It doesn't make any logical sense. Why is he killing motherfuckers? But Moses is like, dude, you know God. He works in retardedly mysterious ways. But he gave me a loophole. All we got to do is kill a bunch of lambs, bleed them out, and then rub their blood above our doors and he won't kill our children. And so they do that. They kill all these innocent lambs and they bleed them. And they rub the blood all over their doors and traumatize their kids. And their kids are like... Why are we doing this? If God is all-knowing, wouldn't he automatically know which one of us are with him and which one of us aren't without us rubbing blood on our doors? And they're like, shut up, kid. And the next thing you know, the smoke monster is being sent down from heaven from God to kill everybody's firstborn kids. And he's like, go kill me some kids, go kill me some kids. Go, can't kill your kid because you got blood on your door. I can't kill your kid because you got blood on your door, but I'm going to still kill me lots of kids. And that's exactly what he does, man. He kills lots of firstborn little babies. So when you tell an anti-abortion person tells you that God is against killing babies, Tell them they need to tell it to the Bible, man, because he clearly has no problem with it. And one of the kids he murders is the Pharaoh's son. Even though he had nothing to do with shit, man, he kills him anyway. And the Pharaoh's like, dude, really? You really had to kill my son, man? That's a fucking dick move. Uncool, dude, uncool. Do you really want to be free that bad? Get the fuck out, dude. And they're like, hooray! Our God murdered lots of innocent kids and babies so we can be set free. Isn't he awesome? Let's get the fuck out of here. So they get the fuck out of there, and they make it all the way to the Red Sea. And then, boom, the Pharaoh shows up out of the middle of nowhere and says, Surprise, motherfuckers! I could have easily killed you while you are still inside my city, but I decided to let you all go so I could chase you down to the Red Sea and kill you here for some reason. And everybody's like, We're fucked! We're fucked! But Moses is like, Chill the fuck out, dudes. I got this. And he's like, I do And then the water splits up, man. And everybody's like, Holy fuck, dude! And Moses is like, run, bitches, run! So everybody does, they run, and as they run past Moses, they're like, I don't understand why God just didn't instantly beam us to the other side. Why does he go through all this pageantry? It doesn't make any logical sense. And Moses is like, just run, motherfuckers! And so they're running, and they all get to the other side, and the Pharaoh is the dumbest motherfucker ever. He never learns his lesson. And he's like, everybody, run directly into certain death! And they're like, yeah, let's run into certain death! So they all do, they run into certain death. And Moses waits, and they all get in there, and then all of a sudden he's like, hee wipe out! And then God sends the waves crashing down the soldiers, and they're all brutally murdered and died for nothing more than following orders like good little soldiers do. And then Moses is like, yay, God just brutally murdered all those dudes for us. Isn't God the shit? And the next thing you know, God orders Moses to climb a mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. But God can't make shit easy on anybody. There's lightning, and there's rain, there's thunder, there's hell, there's all kinds of wind. Moses is struggling to get to the top. And Moses is like, dude, do you want me to get these fucking Ten Commandments or not? And God's like, I want you to get them. I just want your ass to work for it. So finally he does get the Ten Commandments and he brings them down the hill. And the dude's waiting for him. And the dude's like, it's a good thing you went up there all by yourself where nobody can verify if what you said is true or not. Luckily for you, though, these stone tablets are so technologically advanced, there's no possible way you could have forged them yourself. They had to have come from God. So the next thing you know, dudes, Moses and his people, despite God's promises, end up wandering around the desert lost for 40 fucking years. Moses had been promised all kinds of really cool shit by God. But of course, God's a dickhead, so Moses gets lost in the desert for 40 years and wanders around. Then he dies, and then it's 40 years later, and Joshua is standing in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And he's like, God, dude, you totally promised us that we'd have all kinds of land and slaves and cows and shit. Where's my shit, dude? And so God's like, i tell you what, dude, I'll totally let you go into Jericho, the next town over, kill everybody in it, take all their shit. But here's what you got to do first. You got to walk around that motherfucker carrying the Ark of the Covenant and all your soldiers, like, every day for six days. And on the seventh day, you get to walk around it seven times, and then I want you to blow horns at the wall and yell at the motherfucker, and then I'll collapse it, and you can go in and kill everybody. And then Joshua's like, dude, what the fuck would you go through all that trouble for? You're all powerful. Just... Blink everybody in that city, out of that city, and blink us into that city. Aren't we your chosen people? Why would you make us go through so much trouble? 
But God says, dance, monkeys! And so the monkeys dance, and they walk around a bunch of times, they yell at the walls, they blow horns at it, and the walls crumble, and all the people in there die brutally. And then Joshua runs in there, and he kills all the motherfuckers that are still alive, and he chops them up a little bit, and he kills all their animals, and he takes all their shit, and he takes all their virgin daughters to be his sex slaves. And then they're like, yay, God just let us murder all these motherfuckers and take their daughters as sex slaves. Israel, Israel, Israel. And the next thing you know, Joshua's dead. And there's these people called the Philistines who are just fucking shit up. And there aren't any real good heroes left because Joshua's dead, Moses is dead. So God sends these people called judges to lay down the law. Like it's judge fucking dread up in this bitch or some shit. And he goes to this woman who's barren and he sends an angel. And he's like, you're going to have one of the greatest judges ever. But here's the deal, man. You can't let that kid cut his hair ever because his hair will be the source of his power. And she's like, what? What the hell are you talking about? Why would his hair be the source of a magical power, man? That doesn't even make any sense. How are the two things even connected? And the angel's like, bitch, just get pregnant. So she does. She gets pregnant. Next thing you know, she gives birth to sexual chocolate Mark Henry. And she calls him Samson. And he becomes a badass motherfucker. Starts whooping dudes' asses all over the place. And starts making a name for himself and sort of becoming famous. So like pretty much every other black athlete when he becomes famous, he immediately goes out and marries a white woman. And the white people in the town ain't having it. They're like, oh, hell no, that motherfucker ain't marrying no white women. So, of course, they go to his wife's house and they burn her alive. And needless to say, this does not make Samson very happy. He is very disgruntled by this news. He's slow walking up to motherfuckers. And he's like, what do the two hands say to the neck? Snap! He's giving motherfuckers a soup bone, hitting motherfuckers with sticks, kicking doors down, uppercut motherfuckers, he's pushing motherfuckers off high places. He's just killing white folks everywhere. So the townspeople go to Samson, and they're like, dude, you gotta turn yourself in. So Samson's like, okay. So he goes and turns himself in, and the evil racist guy says, kill him. But Samson's like, fuck that shit. And then he goes all Django Unchained, starts breaking free and shit, starts throwing logs at motherfuckers, starts slinging his iron around. And then they got him surrounded, but he ain't scared. Of course not. He sees the jawbone of an ass down on the ground, and he goes, picks it up, starts doing with him, that motherfucker, like he's Bruce Lee. And the next thing you know, He's like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, you're cool, and fuck you, I'm out. And the dudes are pissed off again, and the one dude's like, we gotta get this motherfucker. And the other dude's like, don't worry dude, I know what his kryptonite is. White women, bring me Delilah. So he does, he brings her Delilah, and I ain't saying she a gold digger, but she ain't messing with no gold niggas. Because the next thing you know, she's cutting Samson's hair, and... She must have fucked him ragged first because he ain't waking up worth a shit. So she gets all his hair cut off and then the bad guy comes in. It's like, wake up, Samson. And Samson's like, oh, hell no, you didn't come in my bedroom like this, motherfuckers. I'm going to kill y'all. And he jumps down and he attacks him, but they kick his ass. And he's like, what happened to my strength? Bitch, did you cut my hair? I specifically ask you not to do that. What the fuck is wrong with you? And the bad guy's like, i tell you what's wrong with her. I make it rain, I make it rain, I make it rain on them hoes. And he does, he makes it rain on them hoes. And then he's like, take a good look at this white woman. It's the last white woman you ever gonna see, motherfucker. And he like pokes Samson's eyes out with his thumb. And Samson screams, and he's all in pain and shit. And the next thing you know, Samson's all fucking beat up, tortured, blind. He's in pain. Just like God's chosen people always end up. So the next thing you know, Samson's all in agony and shit. And he's like, hey God, it's me, it's Samson. Remember me? Um... Is there any way that you could possibly, like, give me my powers back for a few minutes and shit? I mean, I know I got short hair and all, but logically we both know that my long hair had absolutely nothing to do with my magical powers to begin with, and you could just give them back to me at any time you wanted to, so could you just give them back to me for a second so I can kill all these motherfuckers? And so God's like, hell yeah, give them back to you so you can kill those motherfuckers. I would really like to see that. So he does, he gives Samson his powers back, and Samson pushes the pillars down, and kills all the motherfuckers brutally, and... Big stones fall on and crush them all, including Sansa himself, who dies horribly. And then his mother has to come cry over his dead, crushed body. And she's like, thanks a lot for choosing my son, God. Fucking dickhead. And so the next thing you know, the prophet Samuel is telling Saul that God wants him to go in the next village and murder every motherfucker in that place, including all the animals and all the little kids, all the women and children. Everybody must die. So Saul goes to the town and he murders pretty much everybody. But he leaves a few people alive for himself to make slaves out of. And he decides to leave some animals alive too. And man, the private sailor is pissed. He's like, motherfucker, what did I tell you? God wanted everybody dead. And that means everybody. So to make his point, 
Samuel, God's own chosen prophet, walks up to the dude and murders him in cold blood and shit, bleeds him out, and he's like, Saul, because you didn't murder all these motherfuckers like God told you to, God is going to choose a new king. So the next thing you know, there's this kid named David who sees this dog minding his own damn business, so he decides to assault the dog, so he throws a rock and hits the dog, and the dog squeals and runs off. So the prophet Samuel sees that, and he's like, dude, I like the cut of your jib, man. God loves the way you used to assault animals without any provocation whatsoever. Come with me, dude. And so they go down by the river, and the prophet Samuel says, God told me if I pour this honey on your head that you'll be king someday. And David's like, what? But the next thing you know, there's like giants stomping around, and the giant's like, can you believe that in 4,000 years, motherfuckers are still going to believe this stupid shit is true? But then the next thing you know, David's like, hey, you lied. You got something on your face. It's a rock, bitch. Can I borrow your sword? You just got chopped. Please pack your knives and go. And he holds up his head, man. He's like, yay, God, just let me brutally murder this motherfucker and cut his head off. Let's chase all these motherfuckers down, kill them, and make slaves out of the one that survives. And they do, man. They chase all the motherfuckers down and murder them all brutally. And they make slaves out of the ones that survive. And David is like the baddest motherfucker on earth, man. He's like fucking Spartacus. He's dual wielding swords. He's like a fucking whirling dervish of death. And he grows up to be this really good-looking, blue-eyed, white dude. And the next thing you know, Saul's like, Hey, David, I'm going to totally give you my daughter, dude. But first, you got to kill a hundred Philistines for me. And David's like, I was going to do that shit anyway. So the next thing you know, David is back. And he throws Saul a bag of 200 foreskins that he cut off 200 Philistines that he killed. He literally throws the guy a bag of dicks. And he's like, here's your bag of dicks, Saul. I want your daughter now. So Saul gives him his daughter for a bag of dicks. And immediately Saul has buyer's remorse. He's like, I don't even want this bag of dicks. Why did I give this guy my daughter for this bag of dicks? And he's like, I'm going to kill David. I dare him give me a bag of dicks. So he goes out and tries to find David to kill him. But before he can, his son gets killed in a battle. So Saul's all depressed and shit, and he's like, I don't want to live on this planet anymore. So he commits ritual seppuku, like he's a fucking Japanese samurai warrior or some shit. And the next thing you know, David is the king. So of course, immediately, he has to start killing motherfuckers and taking their shit. So that's what he does. He attacks Jerusalem, kills motherfucking everybody, and takes all their shit. So the next thing you know, David is taking over Jerusalem. They're all celebrating shit, and he's walking through the streets with his shirt off. Showing off a six pack, looking all cute and shit. Then he sees a girl he thinks is hot. And he's like, hey baby, what's up? And he starts macking on her right in front of her husband. Starts dancing with her. Asking her what her sign is. And it's totally fucking awkward, man. Everybody notices. But David don't give a fuck. He walks back to his quarters all cocky and shit. Puffs out his chest, smiles himself and says, I'm gonna fuck that dude's wife. So the next thing you know, he's all perving on her and shit watching her while she bathes, and he's like, bring that woman to me. So they do, they bring that woman to him, and she says, no, King David, no, we can't do this, I'm married. But King David's like, shut the fuck up, it ain't raping for the king. So basically he rapes this poor girl despite what she says, and the next thing you know, she's pregnant. So of course, he does what any guy chosen by God would do. He orders that her husband be sent to the front lines of the most dangerous battle so he'll be murdered, and that's exactly what happens. He rapes this poor woman, and then he has her husband murdered like a fucking psychopath, and then he marries her himself. And so obviously God is pissed, so he sends a prophet to tell David that he's going to murder David's baby, because that's what God does when he gets pissed, he murders babies. And David's like, what the fuck, why would God murder my little baby for something I did? Why does God murder babies when he's pissed off at people? That's some fucked up shit, dude. But of course, that's what God does. God murders his little baby. But for some reason, he gets him another baby to replace that baby with. Because fuck that first baby. And that's how parts three and four end. With God being a douchebag, just like he always fucking is. And is it just me? Or is God a really fucking poor judge of character? I mean, I'm not all-knowing or all-powerful at all. But somehow, I've managed to live my entire life without hanging around rapists, murderers, and psychopaths. What the fuck is God's problem, man? So the next thing you know, God's chosen people are being brutally murdered again. They're getting hit with fire arrows, smacked in the face with axes. Their holy temple is burning to the ground. And Daniel and his friends get kidnapped into slavery by King Nebuchadnezzar. And he's like, you see this big golden idol right here? This is what you worship now. Bow down, monkeys. So the monkeys bow down. Except for Daniel's friends, who are like, fuck that shit. We can actually see that thing. 
We only worship things that are invisible. And King Nebuchadnezzar gets all pissed. And he's like, kill it with fire. So he throws him in the fire. And they're like, oh, motherfucker, we own fire. Help us, God, help us. And then God appears. And he's like, fuck your fire, nigga. Jesus. And he's glorious and shit. So King Nebuchadnezzar wants to reach out and touch God's boob. But you can't reach out and touch God's boob, dude. So his hand gets burned. And the next thing you know, he's all crazy and shit. And then he dies. So the next thing you know, Cyrus is the king. And he throws Daniel to the lions. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, but Daniel is fucking yoked, dude. He is shredded, man. And the lions are like, Daniel, chill out, dude. We ain't even mad at you. We ain't even mad at you. Do you do P90X? You're looking shredded, dude. You're looking awesome, man. Good for you, Daniel. Good for you. And then Daniel, like, chills out with the lions for a while. They're like best buds. And then King Cyrus opens the door and sees this shit. And then Daniel walks out all cool, and King Cyrus is like, Dude, that was fucking awesome. How did you do that? You're a bad motherfucker, man. You are a bad motherfucker. I tell you what, man, because you're so awesome, I'm going to release you and all your people, and you can go back to Jerusalem, fucking build your temple back up, dude. You can have the good life. I'm letting you go, dude. Get the fuck out of here, you crazy kids. And so finally, God shows the people are free again. And they're like, yay, finally, we can go back to Jerusalem. And have the pleasure-filled, awesome lives that God has promised us. Thank you, God, for pouring your love and bounty down upon us. And the next thing you know, they're all being brutally tortured, crucified. The suffering has never been worse for God's chosen people. They live in a nightmarish, hellish landscape where each day is worse than the day before. And no matter how hard they try, they can never wake up. So the next thing you know, there's this guy, Friend Zone Joseph. And Friend Zone Joseph has a big crush on this girl, Mary. But to be quite honest with you, she's really not that into him. Mary has a thing for bad boys in red cloaks. So the next thing you know, friend zone Joseph is like, Bitch, are you pregnant? You told me you weren't ready to date anybody yet. And Mary's like, Dude, you don't understand. God came down from heaven and impregnated me with himself. And friend zone Joseph was like, Really? God came down from heaven and impregnated his mother with himself. That's incest. Gross. Is that really the story you want to go with? And Mary was like, dude, they stone girls these days from being pregnant out of wedlock. Hell yeah, that's the story I want to go with. You got to help me, Joseph. These motherfuckers are crazy. But Joseph was like, hell no. You should have kept your legs closed. You're on your own, bitch. So the next thing you know, the townspeople are like, kill that bitch. She a slut. Nobody going to marry her. And so the last second, friend zone Joseph runs in. And he's like, I'll marry her, I'll marry her. But you owe me big time, Mary. And so Mary's like, okay. So the next thing you know, they're in some smelly ass barn. There's fucking sheep shit everywhere and cow shit everywhere. It's disgusting, smells terrible. And this is where Jesus is being born because God can't even treat himself right. So the next thing you know, these wise men are coming up. And they're like, we can totally tell that baby is God. Have some free shit. And Mary's like, thanks a lot, dudes. If you came along a couple hours ago, maybe we could have had this baby in the fucking inn instead of this disgusting fucking barn. So the next thing you know, Herod decides to have all the babies in the land killed because he's trying to kill Jesus. And so he does. He sends his troops out to bash babies' heads on the rocks and pull them from their mothers and hit them with swords. And even though the baby Jesus is just a baby, he's still God. You think he could have helped all these babies that are being killed in his place? But fuck no, nor him nor God do anything, and all these babies die brutally. And the only baby to survive is Jesus, because even as a baby, Jesus is a fucking douchebag. So the next thing you know, Herod dies, and God shows the people, say, finally, maybe this is finally our chance to rise up against the Romans and be free like God has promised us. But nope, the uprising is crushed brutally, they're all tortured, murdered. 2,000 alone in the city of Bethlehem are crucified. Jesus nor God helps them any fucking way. So the next thing you know, Jesus is a kid, but there's actually no record of his childhood whatsoever because although he was supposed to be God, I guess his life wasn't important enough to document, so we don't have any fucking records. So the next thing you know, the lead singer of the Counting Crows is like, hey, everybody, come here. God wants me to drown you in the lake for just a second. So people come over to him and he drowns him in the lake for just a second. And then all of a sudden, this really hot fucking white dude walks up. And everybody's like, get the fuck out of the way, everybody. A hot white dude's coming through. And then Counting Crows is like, dude, I can tell you're God by just looking at you. You're fucking hot. Would you like me to drown you in this lake for just a second? And Jesus is like, fuck yeah, I want you to drown me in this lake for just a second. 
So he does, he drowns Jesus in the lake for just a second. And Jesus even fucking looks hot wet, man. This is like the fucking sexiest Jesus ever, dude. All right. So the next thing you know, Jesus has to wander out in the desert for 40 days. Because even though he was born perfect and without sin and he's God on earth, for some odd reason, his soul needs to be tested. I don't know, man. Don't think about it. Anyway, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Barack Obama shows up. And Barack Obama's like, jump, bitch. And Jesus is like, fuck you, Barack Obama. I voted for Ron Paul. So the next thing you know, we noticed that Jesus was just talking to himself the whole damn time. He was never talking to Obama like he's fucking Clint Eastwood or some shit. So the next thing you know, Jesus is out cruising for dudes and he sees a guy he likes. And he says, I want that dude. So he just walks out in the water. And he's like, hey man, let me in your boat. So the dude's like, fuck yeah, I'll let you in my boat. You're fucking hot as shit. So he pulls him over in his boat and Jesus just hangs out in the dude's boat and plays in the water and acts all sexy and shit. Meanwhile, Counting Crows is like, Mr. Jones and me. And then he gets his head cut off, man. And Jesus don't fucking do shit about it, man. Jesus let his friend die and get his head cut off. Even though Jesus is magical, has magical powers and shit, he don't fucking do shit to help Counting Crows whatsoever. And that's how this episode ends, dudes. With Jesus not lifting a fucking finger or using magical powers to help fucking anybody. Just fucking mugging for the camera and trying to look all sexy like a fucking douchebag. And has anybody else noticed the last thing on earth you want to be is one of God's chosen people? They're the ones that get fucked over and tortured the most, man. I'm telling you guys, if you really do believe the Bible is true, you don't want to be anywhere near God. That's the last fucking dude you want to try to hang out with. That dude will fuck you over in a heartbeat. He's kind of a fucking prick. So the next thing you know, Jesus is a fucking rock star. All the kids want to see Jesus. Everybody just wants to touch sexy white Jesus. And the Pharisees are jealous as fuck. They're like, hell no, he gonna get all the pussy. So the next thing you know, Jesus starts healing motherfuckers. And they're like, hey, why don't you just heal everybody on the earth at the same time? There are lots of people out there that are sick and in pain and need your help right now. Aren't you God? Aren't you all powerful? Can't you heal everybody in the world at the same time instead of just the people that are right in front of you? But Jesus is like, nah, I'm just gonna heal this one person right here in front of me and expect you guys to convince everybody else who ever lived throughout all of history that it actually happened. So that's what he does. He only heals the motherfuckers right in front of him. He heals a leper, and the leper's like, thanks, but what about all the other lepers in the world? And Jesus is like, eh, out of sight, out of mind. So the next thing you know, they about to stone a bitch. This guy's like, she a hoe, we gotta kill her. But then Jesus shows up, and he's like, let that bitch go. If any of you motherfuckers have never fucked something you're not supposed to, you throw the first rock. And they're all like, oh, he's right, and they immediately drop the rocks to the ground. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's what I thought, motherfuckers. And she's like, thank you, Jesus, thank you. And Jesus is like, you're welcome, bitch. Go and ho no mo. And so the Pharisees are getting pissed off as fuck. They're like, oh, hell no. First, he's getting all the pussy, and then he ain't letting us stone hoes. This cannot stand. So the next thing you know, there are a thousand motherfuckers waiting on the beach to see Jesus, and there's not enough food. It's basically the fire festival. And Jesus is like, no problem, dudes, I got this shit. Give me those two fish and loaves of bread. And he takes the two fish and loaves of bread and puts it above his head and brings it back down. And there's more fucking fish. And they're like, holy shit, that's awesome, dude. Why don't you just use your magical powers to feed everybody on the earth at the same time? You could wipe out hunger right now and solve so much suffering. Also, instead of just proving to us your God, it would prove to everybody on the earth at the same time that you are. And Jesus is like, nah. I only help motherfuckers who are standing right in front of me. And they're like, hey, Jesus, you're awesome. Jesus, Jesus. So the next thing you know, Jesus comes across these motherfuckers. And they're like, Jesus, my brother fucking Lazarus is dead as shit. Could you possibly resurrect him from the dead, please? And Jesus is like, fuck yeah, I can resurrect him from the dead. I got this shit. So Jesus goes in there and he resurrects this motherfucker from the dead. And Lazarus wakes up. And Lazarus is like, holy shit, dude, thank you for resurrecting me from the dead. Why don't you go ahead and use your magical powers to resurrect everybody in the world right now who has loved ones grieving over them? Not only would that prove to far more people that you actually are God, but it would also end a lot of suffering and misery right now. Why don't you do that? But Jesus is like, nah, I'm just going to resurrect this one motherfucker right here in front of a very few witnesses and expect you few people to go out and convince everybody who ever lives for the rest of history that it actually happened. So the next thing you know, 
Jesus is entering town, riding on a donkey sideways like a lady, being all gender fluid and shit. And they're like, hooray, we love sexy white Jesus. He's dreamy. So the next thing you know, Jesus have dinner with his friends. And he's like, Judas is going to betray the shit out of me. And Judas is like, bitch, I ain't. But he does betray the shit out of him. And he runs away. And Obama is there again for some reason, just looking on. So the next thing you know, the Romans show up and start beating the fuck out of Jesus. And then proceed to brutally torture him. At first, you might think the Romans are the bad guys here. But actually, this is just all part of God's infinitely wise plan. Apparently, according to the all-powerful God, the only way he could forgive our sins is to have his son brutally tortured and murdered. This was always part of his infinitely wise plan from the beginning. So the Romans are simply doing the will of God here. In fact, since God's will is always done, they don't really have a choice here. In fact, if Jesus actually is God, then it's not really the Romans torturing and murdering Jesus. It's Jesus torturing and murdering himself. I mean, none of it really makes any sense anyway. If God wanted us to be forgiven for sins, he could forgive us any way he wanted to. He could just blink his eyes and we could be forgiven. He didn't have to torture and murder his own son. He's all powerful. He could have literally done anything. He could have sent a fluffy, cute little bunny rabbit to take up poop for our sins. But no, God's a fucking dick, tortures and murders his own son. I don't know about you guys, but never once in my entire fucking life have I thought to myself, hey, I was mad at that person over there, but now I really want to forgive them. I wonder what the best way to forgive them is. Hmm, maybe I should have somebody torture and murder my son. Nobody has ever thought this ever, because it doesn't make fucking sense. And after a while, even Jesus is starting to question this shit. He's like, why the fuck did I have to be tortured and died for people's sins? You could have done anything. You could have sent a cute little fluffy bunny rabbit to take a poop for people's sins. And then it'd be awesome, because in the future, little kids could hide fucking eggs and shit as a remembrance of the bunny that pooped for their sins. I mean, that's fucking stupid, but it's a way better idea than having your son tortured and murdered. And the guy next to him was like, hell yeah, that's a way better idea than this shit. And Jesus is like, I know, right? God's retarded. But God's like, shut the fuck up, Jesus. Just die. So Jesus dies. So they take Jesus' body down and they put it in a tomb. And even though the Bible gives three different accounts of what happens next, one of them says that Mary goes to his tomb and the stone is rolled away and she goes inside there and Jesus shows up and he's like, bitch, I ain't in there. And then Jesus shows up to all the disciples and he's like, hey, it's totally me. It's Jesus, dudes. And they're like, Jesus, you're alive. I thought you died for our sins. I mean, if you're still alive, doesn't that totally cheapen the entire sacrifice? You didn't die for our sins. You pretty much just had a bad weekend for our sins. And Jesus is like, God damn, you motherfuckers are annoying. I'll tell you what, I gotta go do some shit, but I'll be back. I'll be back soon. I'll be back sometime in your lifetime. I promise I'll come back and we'll destroy the devil and get rid of evil and save everybody. And they're like, Jesus, why don't you just do it right now? Why don't you just destroy the devil right now and end all the evil and all the suffering on earth and then take us all to heaven with you? And Jesus is like, dudes, back the fuck off, okay? I got some shit I gotta do. Trust me, dudes, I'll be back before too long. Just be patient and wait on me, dudes, but I promise you I will be back in your lifetime. And they're all like, hooray, Jesus will be back in our lifetimes. So the next thing you know, this kid goes out, tries to preach the love of Christ. He's like, Jesus died for our sins, and he's still alive to this very day. And they're like, really? Jesus died for our sins, but he's still alive to this very day. Are you out of your fucking mind? That don't even make no kind of sense. So they start throwing rocks at the motherfucker, and they kill him. And Jesus don't help this motherfucker at all, just lets him die. Because Jesus is a fucking dickhead. And the next thing you know, Christians everywhere being rounded up, beaten and tortured. And as each of his disciples wait on him to come back in their lifetime, as he promised, they are rounded up, tortured, and murdered one by fucking one. Jesus never shows back up to help any of his fucking disciples. Just like the God of the Old Testament, he's a complete fucking dickhead. And that's pretty much how our story ends, folks. With all of Jesus' disciples getting tortured and murdered. And now here we are 2,000 years later with almost 2 billion people still waiting for this motherfucker to come back. How can this be real life? It's been 2,000 years already. It's time for you Christians to accept the fact he ain't coming back. Get over it already. I mean, if these aren't the ridiculous stories that primitive monkeys would tell each other, I don't know what is. Seriously, you people want to have this stuff taught in our schools to our children? No thanks, man.